I'm Russell Pulima, CEO of Pingana Capital Group, and I have with me here today four representatives of GCM Grosvenor, the investment manager for the Pingana Private Equity Trust, PE1. Most of you will be familiar with Corey Lepredi and John Herstritt, who are heavily involved in the day-to-day management of PE1, as well as being regular uh, presenters on our webinars. Uh, today, we also have with us Brian Sullivan and Louis uh, Cabrera. Brian is a managing director and head of the secondary team at Grosvenor, and Lewis is an executive director focusing on secondary investments with specific uh, responsibility for Project Rambler, which is one of our recent exciting secondary investments. The last few months have been particularly eventful for uh, PE1. We are very impressed by the high quality portfolio that has been constructed by GCM, and we are particularly happy with the strong returns that have begun to emerge in the portfolio. I also draw your attention to our monthly newsletter, newsletter, which was released early this morning, which reminds investors that PE1 targets a yearly distribution yield calculated at 4% of the NAV per annum. This means that the percentage change in the NAV or net asset value being currently being experienced uh, by PE1 should have a corresponding impact on, next, on the next distribution to be paid. In line with PE1 strategy, once the portfolio is fully deployed, which is estimated to be about three to four years from the 2019 listing, the aim is to have 15 to 30% of our assets invested in secondaries. The purpose of today's session is to hear directly from the GCM team about the secondary exposures that PE1 has recently, recently acquired, which we think are particularly attractive, as well as secondary opportunities currently being assessed. GCM will speak for around 20 minutes, and then we will have a Q&A session that will take us through to around 9.30. Uh, please submit any questions via your screen. We'll do our best to answer all questions, but considering the large number of people on the call and the short time period, um, we probably won't be able to get through all the questions, but any unanswered questions will be responded to uh, directly after the event. Uh, John, over to you. Thanks so much, Ross. Um, very nice to see everyone this morning. Um, we're really excited to be here and speak to you a little bit uh, more specifically about our secondaries practice and some of the recent activity. Um, as many of you have heard, um, secondaries was the probably the most um, the area that we struggled to deploy the quickest. Um, and we are really excited to see that that's dramatically changed over the last 12 months. Um, what you'll see in the backdrop is that um, starting last year, as we told you, we were starting to see a market develop where we thought there would be tremendous opportunity. Um, the secondary market, the volumes had slowed down dramatically in 2020 uh, due to some buyer and seller recalibration around COVID-19. Um, but what often happens is that that takes time and then people recalibrate and you start to see a pickup in volume dramatically. And so we um, anticipated this to happen and wanted to have capital ready to deploy in advance of this. And so we're excited to say that in the last really six months, we've really deployed a significant amount of capital and some very exciting opportunities in secondaries. And so I, I will hand it first to Corey and then later to Brian, who can take you and Luis, who can take you through the details of it. Um, the three areas that we've really dedicated the majority of capital to is first to GSF3. This is a commingled vehicle that is going to have about 30 to 50 different secondary investments bundled together. It's a highly diversified vehicle and probably the main way we would give exposure to PE1. And so we've already made commitments to GSF3 and, and Brian can talk to you about some of the investments that they've made to date. Um, we also will talk more about Project Rambler, which is a really exciting um, transaction, and Luis will take you through that. And I think you'll see the diversification that it offers, the accelerated cash flows that will be very positive from a distribution standpoint, um, and some of the other benefits that come from a large commitment to a diversified secondary such as Rambler. And then we've also committed to a few other transactions, which 
the team can take you through. Um, rolling that all up, and Corey will show you shortly, um, we're excited to say that we're now 90% committed again with our capital, um, and about 60% of that has been funded or invested to date, and we expect that to continue to ramp. Um, and so we really feel like uh, we are now in a good place with our secondaries book, and it always felt that it was an opportunistic sleeve where you couldn't exactly time when the best opportunities were to show, but we feel really good as to where we are. So with that, I'll hand it over to Corey and you can take us through more details. Good morning. So slide five shows the buildup of the portfolio and its NAV over the course of 2021. There are really just a couple of items that I wanna highlight before I turn it over to my colleagues to walk you through the recent activity in the secondary sleeve in more detail. Um, the slide really illustrates the rapid ramp up in secondary activity that John talked about. Now at 14% of the portfolio, the secondary exposure is exactly where we predicted it would be two years into the life of PE1. And we feel really good about the opportunities we've been able to execute on in relatively short order. Um, while the sleeve now looks a bit larger than all of the other sleeves in terms of commitments, there are a couple of things to note about that. First, uh, a portion of the unfunded amount for secondaries relates to Project Rambler. And for a variety of reasons that uh, Brian and Luis will discuss, we don't believe it will ever be called down. Additionally, because of the shorter duration of many secondary transactions, including Rambler, which is expected to have a particularly short duration, we need to commit a bit more in order to help maintain our secondary exposure over time. And then finally, GSF3 will be deployed over the next several years as we seek to create a diversified portfolio of secondary opportunities and has just started deploying its capital. So the funding of PE1's $45 million commitment to GSF3 will occur over some time. It is also important to note that our co-investment and opportunistic sleeves are now at or near full investment. So new commitments to co-investments and opportunistic investments are expected to occur within the next three to six months. We will also continue to be making new primary fund commitments every year. So in the end, we expect all of these sleeves will generally be in line with our target long-term portfolio within the three to four years we discussed when PE1 launched. Looking quickly at the mix of investment types, very strong performance of the investments within our opportunistic sleeve has helped that portion of the portfolio grow to over 35% of the portfolio. That will normalize over time as realizations within the portfolio occur. And it is worth noting that we believe there will be some potential realizations within both the opportunistic and co-investment sleeves in the near term. Finally, you can see that the amount of cash in the portfolio has gone down by half over the course of 2021, as prior unfunded commitments have been called and the new secondaries have been executed and funded. We would expect the amount of cash to continue to become a smaller portion of the portfolio, though importantly, there will always be some cash maintained in the portfolio to fund near-term obligations and to execute on attractive opportunities when they arise. Additionally, the cash amount on any given date will be a moving target as realizations occur opportunistically within private equity. As has always been our plan, uh, and in line with the cash flow model we need to maintain for PE1, we are constantly assessing new opportunities and making new commitments so that we can maintain targeted exposures in each sleeve, and then we can make sure the portfolio is appropriately diversified. With that, I'll turn it over to Brian Sullivan uh, to take us through the secondaries in more detail. Yeah. Hi, everyone. As John and Corey mentioned, one of the, one of the commitments from the vehicle is to uh, Grosvenor Secondary Opportunity Fund 3. We refer to it as GSF3, just as a reminder of what this vehicle is all about. It's a single point of entry into a diversified portfolio of secondary assets. We're targeting returns in the high teens. We're going to be sourcing and executing deals on a global basis. Uh, John mentioned earlier, roughly 30 to 50 transactions will be executed in the fund over the next three or so years. Um, the target assets are going to be largely middle market buyout assets. Uh, while we're doing it on a global basis, we're really leveraging the relationships and information that come from the Grosvenor platform, um, those, uh, you know, that, that, those relationships are largely in the United States. Uh, by way of update for this vehicle, we have five transactions that are in various stage of closing. Uh, we've closed on three of them. We have two transactions that are uh, negotiated and just moving to signing. We'll probably be closing those over the next month or so. Um, and those are a mix of deals that we can go into a bit more detail. Next slide, please. So the, on the left side, this shows the, 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 the current view of our pipeline. You'll see uh, deals one through five. Those are the ones I referred to on the prior slide. The first two, um, the first three have been closed. 
deals four and five are pending close. Again, we're, we're expecting to get, get those across the finish line next month. I, I want to spend more time on the right-hand side, and both John and Corey have spoken to this. And this shows secondary transaction volume over the last few years. You'll notice that there was a substantial decline in volume uh, last year because of COVID. And that was less, uh, less because there were fewer sellers and more because the buyers didn't want to pay uh, what was largely pre-COVID valuations for assets that had largely been impacted by COVID. We're now seeing a change in, in the first part of this year and expect for the, the majority of the, the year. Transaction volume is already up substantially. We're seeing a wave of really interesting deals at compelling prices. We'll talk about some of them, include, including Project Rambler. Next page, please. I'll pass it to uh, Luis, who's going to cover Project 3. I'll speak to Project 4, and then we'll get into the, the Meteor Project of Rambler. Thanks, Ryan. So Project 3 is uh, it's a deal we did with BC Partners, who coordinated a secondary process for regular older vintage funds, which we already happen to be invested in. Uh, the key remaining asset here was a very high quality. It's in a stable recession resistant market. It was kind of a high or mid single digit growth top line type of profile for a business where the company has a very strong competitive position and high free cash flow. Where when you look at our cost basis going in, we will be cash flowing over 10% in the first year. So given the stability of this business, and the history we've had with it over its tenure within the fund we were already invested in, this was a very attractive deal for us and, and a nice value play, especially when you factor in that we were getting in at a 10% discount to the record date, which we think is below the true market value for this asset. And it will likely ultimately be a higher discount when we get that first capital account statement after closing as the business is having a great year and we had visibility to this performance prior to closing. I'll now pass it to Brian who can uh, discuss project four. Yeah, project four is a, is a similar-ish story. This, this is a, trans, a secondary transaction involving another one of Grovner's managers, a group called Alpine Investors, which is a middle market fund manager on the, the West coast of the US. In this transaction, the sponsor coordinated a liquidity event on behalf of some of the investors in the fund. This, again, this was a, a fund that we were already in a, uh, an investor in. We had been tracking the company over a period of time. Um, the company, one of the, one of the key companies in the transaction was an online marketplace for wellness and, and advice. It's a business of scale, $40 million of operating income, growing at uh, over double digit rates, great free cash flow conversion, and while you'll see on the slide, it says a, the pricing was a 0% discount, that is very misleading because the sponsor carried the asset at a really conservative value. And we believe that this asset, if it was sold today, could be sold you know, at least 25% higher than where it's carried. So while there won't be this accounting discount, we, we, we did get a very substantial discount at the buy. Now I'll pass it to Luis, who will speak more to, more to Project Rambler, which is going to be a very uh, significant investment for PE1. So on the next slide, we uh, have a profile of Project Rambler, and this is a transaction we recently closed and are quite excited about. So it involved the acquisition of a portfolio which had exposure to 35 individual underlying funds all in the US middle market buyout space. So from a secondary transaction perspective, this one really checked all the boxes for us. There was diversified exposure, a significant discounted entry, a short expected duration, strong potential returns, and all of this being generated from a high quality portfolio. And most importantly, we had a good angle on the diligence here, which gave us a lot of visibility into some of the near-term catalysts. And I'll go into a bit of detail on each of those in a moment. So we mentioned there were 35 funds we were buying into. Those funds in turn have exposure to over 100 underlying companies of which there were no large concentrations. 
So actually, when you look through to the top 25 positions, those made up 70% of the NAV that we purchased, which is a very good level of diversification. And the discount on this transaction is particularly attractive in light of the diversification. So one of the key parts to this deal is that we were essentially buying the portfolio off of valuations that were set during the pandemic trough. So our headline price to the seller was a 5% discount. We were paying 95% based on underlying asset values set essentially back in September of 2020. So in effect, by the time we closed at June 30th of 2021, we had nine months of run-ups in equity values. We had a lot of exit activity, and we ultimately did not have to pay for that. It all accrued to our benefit. And to put some high-level numbers behind it, we have, some, we have a bar chart on the bottom left of the page. So when the seller agreed to this 95% price, which was the latest which was against the latest reported NAV to them, this sounded like a very full price. It sounded like a fair price. Now, what wasn't in focus to them was that the portfolio between the date that that portfolio was marked for them and when we closed appreciated around 20% between that record date and closing date. And around 40% of the portfolio was exited at valuations above where they were marked. And so when you think of that 20% top line valuation gain getting applied to the smaller remaining base of assets, our entry discount gets leveraged heavily in our favor. So I know that was a bit of a mouthful for the uninitiated on secondaries. However, the benefit of this nine months of strong gains and distributions between the valuation date and our closing is basically how this 95% price to the seller translated to only 70 cents on the dollar for us when we as the buyer stepped into the deal. So when we look at the price that we came in at, this was more like a 30% plus discount type of transaction. And I'll speak a bit to the duration of the deal. So the portfolio is liquidating very quickly. The expected average duration is just over a year from closing and 40% of the portfolio was already liquidated since 1231 of 2020. So for reference, we were already receiving distributions on our investment within a week after closing. Um, materially, all of the funds in the portfolio are mature and they were looking to liquidate their remaining assets in the near term. And as such, a very minimal amount of remaining unfunded capital is expected to be called. And particularly in light of the distributions that are coming off of the portfolio already, we would expect that most, if any, cash flow needs would be covered by those distributions as well. So when we take a step back and we think about this deal, given the diversification, given the discount that we've locked in, we have great visibility for much of the return that has already occurred from these exits that are happening or happened in the portfolio and from write-ups that the managers have already taken on the appreciation of the underlying assets. So we expect that the bulk of the underwritten gain on this deal is to come from this discount, which we have already captured at closing and will be reflected you know, in our capital account balances um, shortly after closing. So flipping to the next slide, I can highlight some of the portfolio stats at a high level. So as mentioned, this is a portfolio of high quality funds. And as you can see in the pie chart in the top left, over two thirds of the portfolio involve funds that were either first or second quartile for their vintages. And working clockwise in the top right, you can see the diversification across the top fund exposures. So not only do I wanna highlight here that the level of diversification of funds we have, but also you can imagine this is a very difficult portfolio to underwrite if you don't have access to the right information. So given the lack of concentration here and the fact that the portfolio was in these lesser known middle market buyout names, when you compare those to larger funds that trade more frequently, you need to have good coverage of the underlying funds and you need access to get the intel on that portfolio activity, which is essentially what led to us being able to get a large discounted entry given the visibility we had into that. So in our case, 
we had the coverage of the portfolio, we have access to these managers, and we were able to use that visibility and the portfolio movements um, to essentially be in a transaction, which was a very limited process where other groups simply didn't have the information to be competitive against us. And lastly, I'll mention on the bottom two charts, we have great sector diversification as well. You know, our large exposure in healthcare, these are very stable end markets. We have no key areas of concern across the portfolio. And in the final bottom chart on the left side, this shows the age of the portfolio. And with all the funds being 2012 vintages or much earlier, which is why we are seeing such a rapid clip of distribution activity, you know, we do expect this to continue to liquidate very quickly. Uh, to, to sum up the transaction from my perspective, you know, as mentioned, we expect this to be a great deal. It is a sizable exposure for PE1. It's off to a very good start with those distributions we're already seeing in these weeks following closing. Um, and we're excited to have it in the portfolio. So Luis, um, before we hand it back to Russ, um, I think it's important to just point out that this was the type of transaction that we were really looking for from day one. And they don't come upon, you know, they don't come up all the time. And, and the reason I think Luis called out a number of things, one, the diversification from a vintage standpoint, the idea that we can get PE1 investors exposure of private equity funds going all the way back to 2004. It with a investment that started in 2019 is highly unique and provides great diversification to just the sheer size of the commitment. And then the diversification of the number of underlying funds the lack of concentration, as Luis pointed out, and the accelerated cash flows and distributions. Um, all of this provides just a great foundation for PE1 to have secondary exposure as we go through the ramp up period. Because as Corey showed you earlier, it takes a normal primary investment, a significant amount of time to find the deals, fund the deals, and kind of go through that life cycle. And so when you're able to buy a secondary like this, which is relatively mature, um, it really accelerates the ramp. And uh, so we're really excited to have this. So maybe with that, we can hand it over to Russ for some Q&A. Uh, th th thanks, John. Uh, so um, we'll try to get through some questions. Uh, I'll, uh, we've got lots of questions, uh, but some of them are focused not on the secondary transaction, or, or, but are more general around uh, the vehicle. Um, I, so I might leave those aside and, and, and we'll get back to um, uh, people afterwards uh, on those questions. So firstly, I think there's a key theme in questions here about, um, and probably Lewis or, or, um, or Brian uh, to answer this, uh, why um, was GCM able to get such a great deal um, in Project Rambler? Surely the seller realised that they were giving away massive amounts of upside um, and yet somehow this, um, this, this deal was transacted. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to start off on that one. So, you know, you said surely they did realize they were giving up so much upside. Many times they're not focused on that. So from a seller's perspective, many times they're backwards looking where we are purely forwards looking. And for them, this was this represented a very small exposure for them relative to the size of their asset base. So this involved the manager looking to wind down a position, lock it in, and to them, they had a headline price of 95 cents on the dollar in the middle of a pandemic and to wind down what was for them a successful program already where they had a number of very high-performing funds in this portfolio, which had generated significant returns for them. And so we are the beneficiary of that they were not doing the math and tracking each individual line item like we were for that kind of record date to closing um, appreciation. And that's really where we spend our time and what our team is focused on doing. So, you know, as, as John mentioned, we were waiting for the right deal. And, and this is the one that just kind of crept into our lap and, uh, and we were able to take advantage of it. We're not going to have this deal, you know, every month. But, you know, we're on the lookout for these situations where we have the information to uh, transact on them. I, right. I think another way, another way, Russ, just to explain this very simple terms, we, we can maximize tremendous value on the tail of someone's investment because private equity lasts so long. And some of these funds, 
people have made a lot of money on these things already and they're ready to move on for whatever reason. And, and Brian and Luis can talk about all the different reasons. You have a new CIO, you have you know, c- new commitments. There, there are many different reasons why people are ready to kind of clean up. And so the discount might look material on that small portion to them, which is the tail of their investment and doesn't dramatically change the economics of their portfolio. Whereas we can step in and actually make tremendous value added kind of investments at that point looking forward. Great, thanks. Um, as a follow on to that question, was this a competitive deal uh, or was this only a one on one negotiation? Yeah, so this, this, this was a competitive deal. However, the, the seller wanted to transact in a smooth manner. And we were one of the few, we believe the only buyer that had, you know, almost perfect visibility to the underlying portfolio. So from the seller's perspective, they wanted to transact with somebody that knew the portfolio well. And as a result, they viewed that to be lower execution risk. Thanks, Brian. Um, Next question. Rambler was done at a, at, a, at a large discount, but some of the other transactions that you put on the screen uh, were at no discounts. Surely it would be better to only transact on portfolios with, uh, with large discounts. Yeah, so that, that, that's interesting. You know, one of the important things about private equity is that the values at which sponsors carry the assets is part art and part science. It's not really a market value. It's the It's the value that the sponsor assigns to that asset. And the sponsor will try to do what they think is reasonable, but generally asset values tend to be sticky when they're going up and sticky on the way down, you know, if if something's going wrong. Um, We, uh, and obviously the bigger the discount from relative to the reported value, the more friction costs there or the more friction there is in a deal. There are very few sellers are willing to sell at north of a 10% discount to the reported value. So we look for situations where you know, we can reference an old date, so the valuation is stale, where the sponsor's valuation methodology results in a really conservative value, and where the performance trend of the company has been well above average, well above budget, well above norms, since the valuation date. And that's the case for the few of those deals we presented in that slide. And and I mentioned for one of them, uh, just by way of reference, we have really good visibility that that asset could be sold in north of 25% higher than than our buy-in price because the sponsor is just particularly conservative in how they carry the asset. In addition, I didn't mention this, the, the company is performing well above budget. In fact, in the first quarter of this year, uh, its performance over last year was up 50%. Um, and that, you know, that growth rate hasn't yet been captured in the valuation. So looking at the, we refer to it as the headline discount, the discount to the reported value, can in some cases be a little misleading. Um, th- thank, thanks, Brian. Uh, next question is around the, um, the attributes of uh, secondaries that um, make them particularly interesting in a diversified private, private equity portfolio. Why are secondaries different to primaries or co-invest, et cetera? Yeah, secondaries have a few, few characteristics that um, investors like to see. One is that gen- generally we're buying at a discount you know, to, to where, that, where the company would otherwise trade. So there's no J-curve. You know, normally in private equity, the investments are made over a over a a four-year period and then harvested beyond that. And during that period, um, you can see negative returns until the the investments begin to to perform like they should. For secondaries, because you're buying at a discount, you don't have that negative performance early in the the fund's life. John mentioned, and and you, you, uh, you you saw in a theory to practice, that we get backward diversification. You know, people like buying older assets and those older assets by definition are likely to be exited in a shorter time period than 
than would otherwise be the case for a primary investment or a co-investment. So there's more a natural uh, smoothing of cash flows. You know, we're making investments, but also getting getting cash back relatively quickly. Uh, thanks. Um, uh, next question, I'm, I'm, I might leave this as a, as a, as the final a final uh, uh, question because we we uh, have uh, have run out of time. But I think it's a, it's an important one. Um, how big do you see the um, secondary sleeve getting? You know, we've said fifteen to thirty percent of the portfolio, but um, you know, we, it's already uh, a quite large relative to the other sleeves. And you've spoken about additional transactions. Where do you see all this going? I, I could take this. I, you know, I, I think you know, given the shorter duration of the secondaries, um, and a, as I noted earlier, you're going to end up having what will look like a little bit of a commitment uh, imbalance uh, within in the portfolio. But your actual exposures um, across the portfolio will line up in the sort of twenty percentage range when we get to the long term portfolio. We were always targeting, you know, I think it was fifteen to thirty percent in, in our documentation, and we figure it'll it'll be in that twenty twenty maybe twenty plus percent range uh, uh, once we normalize. But you may see some uh, what will look like noise of an increased commitment amount um, because you're deploying money, some that will never be drawn down due to cash flows coming off the investments, um, and and then two um, just because of the uh, the quicker flips of the uh, of, of the deals. Uh, great, thanks. And just one final question, uh, and then we'll let everyone go. Um, and that is uh, for the secondaries that we've done and the secondaries that we can imagine doing into the future. What is the um, rate of return? That we can expect from uh, from these exposures. So we're 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 looking for deals and finding deals where with the underwritten return is in the high teens. In some cases, it's it's well above that um, on an underwritten basis. And from what we are seeing in the market, we we think the next couple of years could have, could be you know some of the most interesting years to be investing in the secondary space. Great, thank you. Uh, well, th- th- thank you, um, uh, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, p- please feel free to uh, call us or send in additional questions um, after the after the session. Uh, we will uh, uh, get back to everybody soon with answers to questions uh, that that were asked. Um, and um, keep um, keep safe, every- everyone, um, and hope to meet up uh, in person in the not too distant future. Thank you. <laughs>